All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome, thank you for coming out. Um, my name is Polly Reynolds. I'm the head of adult services and archives here at the Hudson Library. Um, is this the first time anyone's attended the library for a program, or have you guys have all been here? Oh, okay, there's a few of you. Um, we do have a number of brochures back there for our upcoming author events. Um, I did want to mention one since some of, since you're here for a science program. I thought I'd like to mention another sciency program coming up on Thursday, September 27th at 7 p.m. Dr. Sandeep Johar, cardiologist and best-selling author of *Intern and Doctored*, is going to come and discuss heart history. It's about the colorful and little-known story of the doctors who risk their careers and the patients who risk their lives to know and heal our most vital organ. And we thought it'd be, you know, it's the Cleveland area. We've got the Cleveland Clinic, heart care. Um, we just thought it made a lot of sense to bring him out. And be a really interesting discussion. So join us for that. You can sign up for these programs online. Um, I'm really excited to um, introduce tonight's speaker, Sam Keen. Um, I actually took home one of his books from the library to, you know, I had it on my nightstand and my husband saw it and stole it and read the whole thing and then promptly asked me for all of his other books. So he read all of them. <laughs> I feel really bad because he couldn't even come tonight. He's home watching the kids. So at least we're recording it. So, But all of Sam's books are for sale. Thanks to the Learned Owl for coming out tonight. Um, they'll be on sale back there. And afterwards, join us for a book signing and reception. There'll be cookies, coffee, meet the author afterwards. And that'll be in the rotunda. Just go back out through the library um, and come back th through and, and we'll be in there. Um, Sam Keen's stories have appeared in the best American science and nature writing, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times Magazine, Slate, and Psychology Today, and his work has been featured on NPR's Radio Lab, Science Friday, and All Things Considered. Caesar's Last Breath was named the Guardian Science Book of the Year in 2017, while The Disappearing Spoon was a runner-up for the Royal Society Book of the Year. Both The Violinist Thumb and the dueling neurosurgeons were nominated for Penn's Literary Science Writing Award. Please join me in welcoming Sam Keen. Well, hello everyone. Thank you all for joining me this evening. So I had a bad go of things in about third grade or so. Uh, I came down with strep throat something like a dozen times that year. And every time I did, I got to stay home from school. So it wasn't all bad as far as I was concerned. But, you know, I was feeling kind of achy, kind of fluey. And my mother would get a little fussy, get a little worried over me. So she would come in and she would take my temperature with one of those old-fashioned mercury thermometers, like you can see in the picture. Can't find them much nowadays, but that's what we had back then. And I admit, uh, I was a little clumsy when I was a kid. I was also very prone to talking to myself. Uh, so whenever my mother would try to take my temperature, uh, you know, maybe the phone would ring or she'd leave the room for a moment, whatever, I'd start gabbing to myself, talking to an imaginary friend, whatever. And not infrequently, this would happen. And the thermometer would fall onto our hardwood floor and it would shatter and all the mercury would go spilling out of the thermometer. But I always admit I was kind of secretly excited when that happened because I loved watching the mercury go spilling all over the place. It was like these little liquid ball bearings all over the floor. And my mother, you know, she was actually very cool about the whole thing. She never panicked, she never made us evacuate the house or anything like that. She would actually get down on her hands and knees with a toothpick and she would start to brush the little spheres of mercury toward each other. And my favorite part was when she had two little spheres right next to each other. And I'd kind of be looking over her shoulder, watching her, and she would give them one final nudge, and then they would jump together into this slightly larger sphere that was perfectly seamless. And I just thought it was the most amazing substance I had ever seen in my life. I mean, it's a metal, so it's nice and heavy like that but very shiny and very attractive. It was also a liquid, it could flow around. And I just thought it was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. 
And I managed to, you know, accidentally uh, break enough thermometers over the years where we had quite a nice collection of mercury. My mother kept it on a little pill jar and a knick-knack shelf in our house. And if we'd been good that day, she would get it down, she'd whisk it around, let us play with it a little bit. I had a lot of really nice memories of this one metal, mercury. So then when we got introduced to the periodic table for the very first time in school, maybe even around that same year, third grade or so, first thing I did was try to find mercury on the periodic table. And I looked top to bottom looking for mercury and I couldn't find it. I, I just didn't see mercury on there. And of course mercury is on the periodic table, uh, but the symbol for mercury is actually HG. Neither of those letters are actually in the word mercury. And so I thought, well, boy, that's pretty stupid. Why would that be the symbol if those letters aren't actually in the word? So then I looked into it a little more and I found out that, oh, okay, it actually comes from some Greek and Latin words. And I thought, oh, you know, that's really interesting. I didn't know they knew about this metal thousands of years ago. And it turns out that not only did they know about it, but that there was a god that they associated with this element, with mercury also a planet that they associated with it. So it wasn't just that they knew about this metal, they also associated it with different things in their culture. It meant more to them than just this substance as a metal. And actually, the more I looked into mercury, the more I realized that it really did have this rich, interesting, unusual history. It kept popping up over and over in different contexts. Alchemists, for instance, were obsessed with mercury. They were always using it in different experiments for different sort of, sort of nefarious or weird purposes. When they were colonizing the New World, they actually shipped whole galleons full of mercury over because it happens to be a very effective tool for gold and silver mining. So it had an important part to play in colonizing the New World. There were even some unusual connections to American history. Uh, so I am from the Midwest. I'm actually from South Dakota. So we actually always had a very long uh, Lewis and Clark section in our local history class. But there was one story about Lewis and Clark that they did not bring up in school for reasons I think will probably be uh, obvious once I get to it. Uh, but to start this story, it actually begins with uh, this man right here, Dr. Benjamin Rush, considered one of the founding fathers of the United States. He signed the Declaration of Independence, did that whole thing. Uh, he was actually best known in his day. He was a physician, he was a doctor best known in his day for staying behind during a yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in the 1790s. Uh, basically, every other doctor just fled the city, abandoned their patients, but he very bravely stayed behind and treated a lot of people who wouldn't have gotten treatment otherwise. Uh, unfortunately, uh, his pet treatment for pretty much any ailment you had was this mercury chloride compound he would kind of force feed them. Uh, often until their hair started falling out, their teeth would get loose and fall out, they'd start drooling from the side of their mouths. Uh, the idea in medicine at the time was that people wanted to know they weren't getting ripped off. They wanted to know there was some sort of active compound in what they were buying. And, you know, the mercury sure provoked a reaction. People knew there was something active in the mercury. So they thought it was a great medicine. It's not how we think about it nowadays, obviously, but Dr. Rush thought this was a fantastic treatment, ended up selling them, mass producing them, uh, and he sold them as what he called Dr. Rush's bilious pills. Each was about four times the size of an aspirin, so very large pills, and he packed 600 of them with Lewis and Clark when they went wandering through the wilderness. And there's really no delicate way to put it. Uh, these pills were extremely powerful laxatives. They called them thunderclappers. And the idea was that if Lewis and Clark or someone in their party ate something they shouldn't have, they drank some questionable water, they could basically pop one of these pills and it would flush them out. It would get rid of everything in their system. Mercury is a poison. Your body does not want it inside you. It will go through you very quickly. And it's actually had a bit of a side benefit for historians and archaeologists today uh, in that they can actually still pinpoint a few places where they know Lewis and Clark must have stayed <laughs> because the level of mercury in the soil is just too high to have been natural. So from this one element then, just one element, I learned some unusual American history, but I also learned about etymology, word origins. 
I learned about alchemy. I learned about mining. I learned about mythology, poison forensics, even a little bit of chemistry. And what really got me interested in science, looking back on it, was hearing about these different types of stories, hearing stories about scientists, about different substances, different processes, things like that. And when I went to high school eventually, I was focused on being a scientist, completely committed to being a scientist. Took all the science classes I could, eventually went to college, University of Minnesota, again, very, very focused on science, became a physics major there, was really loving my science classes, thought I was gonna go on to grad school, become a professional scientist, until about year three or so of being a physics major, something kind of swerved on me. I still like my classes a lot, like the lecture classes, uh, but then we started some kind of hardcore intensive labs. And I noticed that some, you know, things were happening that maybe shouldn't have been happening. Things like this, for instance. I would drop something and it would break. Maybe the thermometer should have been a bit of foreshadowing there, but you know, it was still kind of frustrating to be in lab and just not have things work right. But even more than that, I just realized that I wasn't enjoying being in labs as much as other people were. They loved sort of the problem solving, the tinkering aspect of it in a way that I just didn't. I found it very frustrating, the entire experience. And for really the first time in my life, I started thinking to myself, you know, like, well, maybe I don't actually want to be a scientist. Maybe I want to do something else. Uh, and it was a bit of a scary moment for me in that I'd never really considered doing anything else with myself. It's almost like I didn't know who I was anymore if I wasn't going to be a scientist. It was a scary thing to go through. And, you know, I found out since that it's a very common thing for people to go through when they're undergraduates. But at the time, I didn't really know anyone else in that predicament. Um, and so what I decided to do is I decided to sort of panic and run to the other end of campus, and I got an English major uh, kind of on the side. So I was working on both tracks, the English major and the physics major. But eventually, you know, even though I really loved writing papers, reading books and plays and poems and things like that, eventually I just missed the science. I wanted to be involved in the science to some degree. And so eventually I decided the best way to combine them would be to write about science started working for some different publications, and eventually I realized that books were probably the best option for me. And so not long after that, I decided to write my first book, The Periodic Table, uh, and the premise of it is basically to find a funny or spooky or weird story about every single element on the periodic table. So kind of like what I did with the Mercury story there at the beginning, to find all the stories about the elements. And I really had two big motivations in writing the book. Uh, one of them was that, I don't know what your experience was in your chemistry class whenever uh, you had a high school or college, but I remember being a little frustrated in that there were just huge swaths of the periodic table that we never, ever got to talk about. They never, ever came up in class. And I just wanted to know what those elements were like. What, were, you know, what roles did they play? I wanted to give them a bit of a personality by telling stories about them. But the other motivation I really had for this book was that I knew that there were a lot of great stories out there about elements that everyone thinks they know pretty well, but that actually have kind of a hidden, unusual backstory to them if you dig a little bit deeper. And probably the best example of that, of an element with a hidden unusual backstory, is the element aluminum. So we all know aluminum today, of course. It's in pop cans and Little League baseball bats, aluminum foil. It's kind of a throwaway element, one we don't probably think about a whole lot. Uh, but believe it or not, for a long time during the 1800s, aluminum was actually the most precious metal on Earth. It was worth far more than silver was, worth far more even than gold was. And the reason why is that even though aluminum is very common, it's the most common metal in the Earth's crust, it's always very tightly bonded to another element out in nature, usually to oxygen. So it's not like you can go out and find a mother load of pure aluminum somewhere. It's always in a mineral form. And it actually takes a lot of work to get those oxygen atoms off of the aluminum. So when chemists in the very early 1800s started to get the first pure samples of aluminum, it was considered kind of a miraculous metal. It was very light, but also very strong, very attractive. It basically had everything you would want in a metal. 
And because it was so hard to produce and so rare, it became something of a status symbol for kings and emperors to get their hands on samples of aluminum. So right here, you're looking at an aluminum centerpiece that was created for one of the emperors of France. And that is aluminum on the top, and then that's gold beneath it. Because aluminum was the more impressive metal, so obviously you would want that on top. Uh, another emperor of France also had this prized set of aluminum cutlery that he reserved for his most favored guests at banquets. And the lesser nobility were actually reduced to eating with gold knives and forks. And it was considered very embarrassing to be seen eating with the gold knives and forks when there was aluminum silverware available. And even the United States got into this game a little bit. Uh, does anyone recognize what this is right here? It's kind of an odd angle of it, but... Not the Wright brothers. It is actually the very top of something in where I live nowadays in Washington, D.C. It is the Washington Monument at the very, very top. And when the government was putting up the Washington Monument in the 1880s, they decided to put at the very tippity top a six-inch pyramid of aluminum, as you can see right there. And the reason they did this is that the U.S. government was kind of bragging a little. Actually, there were two reasons. Uh, one of them was that if you've ever seen the Washington Monument uh, or been down there, you know that it's kind of sticking up by itself on the National Mall and there's nothing else around it. So they knew lightning was going to strike it at some point. They needed a metal up there to act as a lightning rod to conduct it, the electricity to the ground. But the reason they chose aluminum out of all the other metals they could have chosen is that, as I said, the U.S. government was bragging a little bit. They were saying, you know, we are such an up-and-coming industrial power that we can afford to put aluminum on our public monuments. Isn't that impressive? And other countries around the world were very impressed. For a while, um, because not long after that, the aluminum market basically crashed completely. What happened was a few chemists, a couple of European chemists and an American chemist, uh, figured out how to mass produce aluminum on an industrial scale for the first time. Uh, the American chemist was a very famous young man named Charles Hall. He actually did his undergraduate work on aluminum production at Oberlin College right here in Ohio. Figured out the process when he was just 23 years old. They called him the aluminum boy wonder. And probably no one ever made more money more quickly on the periodic table than Charles Hall did. Uh, he eventually founded a company, Aluminum Company of America, now known as Alcoa. And when he started Alcoa, he was shipping out about you know, 50 pounds of aluminum or so every day. And that was plenty to meet demand worldwide. Uh, 20 years later, he was shipping out nearly 90,000 pounds of aluminum every single day, and he could barely keep up with orders. He died a very, very wealthy man. And I really like this story of aluminum because it gets me thinking about you know, how we value elements and how their values change over time. Are there elements nowadays that we take for granted that in the future are going to be worth a lot of money? And conversely, are there elements that everyone loves and pays a lot of attention to nowadays that in the future we're just not going to pay attention to very much. And it also makes me wonder whether aluminum was better off back then when it was one of the most precious metals on earth, but one that was very rare and no one really had access to. Or is it better off today when it's one of the more productive metals on earth, but one that's very passe, one we don't really pay attention to. You could really look at it either ways. And again, it goes to show you how the, the fortunes of the elements really do change over time if you look a little bit deeper at their stories. So that was my first book, uh, The Disappearing Spoon. And then a few years after that, I wrote a second book called The Violinist Thumb. And if you can may I don't know if you can quite see it there, but you can see maybe a double helix on the uh, violin there. This is a book about genetics, about DNA, biology, things like that. And again, with this book, what I really wanted to do is I wanted it to be a story book. I wanted to tell a lot of stories about human genes, human DNA, human genetics, and starting with what I think is maybe one of the most amazing things about DNA and our genes, and that they really are this universal, unifying theme of biology. Because basically, genes and DNA work the exact same way in all creatures, in all known forms of life whether you're talking about tulips, 
guinea pigs, bacteria, toads, toadstools, slime molds, dung beetles, members of Congress, whatever. <laughs> Genes and DNA work the same way in all of these bizarre creatures. And I just thought that's so fascinating. It really is the unifying universal theme of biology. But one thing I noticed pretty quickly writing the book is that there is one thing that is quite different about the DNA and genes of human beings and the DNA and genes of other life forms. And that difference is the names of the genes, the names of these stretches of DNA that do something in our bodies. Because if you've ever you know, read maybe a newspaper story or something, or maybe even looked at a journal article about a human gene, uh, you might have noticed something, that there are these really ugly, long, terrible names. There's a lot of jargony words in them, and like numbers and Greek letters appearing randomly in the middle. They're really hard to parse and understand. But actually, when it comes to the names of animal genes, scientists have a little bit more leeway. They can be a little bit more creative, have a little bit more fun when it comes to the genes or the names of animal genes. Um, and I'm especially, this is especially true when it comes to the names of this species right here, the fruit fly. Uh, now they might not look it, they probably don't look particularly witty, but fruit flies have actually inspired more creative and unusual gene names than any other animal out there combined. Uh, there are different fruit fly genes named Groucho. There's one called Smurf, Lost in Space, Fear of intimacy. Uh, triple, after those multiplying fuzzballs on that very famous episode of Star Trek. There's the faint sausage gene. I have no idea what the faint sausage gene does, but it's not a bad name. Uh, there's the tin man gene. And when the tin man gene gets mutated, fruit flies cannot develop a heart. So that kind of makes sense. Um, there's a gene that leaves fruit flies exceptionally tipsy after a tiny, tiny sip of alcohol. It's called the cheap date gene, so that kind of makes sense. Probably my favorite gene name, though, uh, did not originate in a fruit fly. It was actually first discovered in a mouse, and that was the POK erythroid myeloid ontogenic gene. Now, at a glance, that is a perfect example of a terrible, terrible gene name, where unless you're a specialist, you basically have no idea what any of those words or abbreviations even mean. But if you look a little bit closer, the first three letters there are P-O-K, then there's an E, then at the beginning of the next word there's an M. It kind of spells out Pokemon. <laughs> and in fact, the scientists who discovered this gene, they named it the Pokemon gene. They published a paper about it, referring to it as the Pokemon gene. And it therefore became the official name of this gene. And you know, everyone had kind of a good laugh about this goofy gene name, except you can see right after, the, oops, you can see right, there's the laser. Right after the word Pokemon, there's, there's a little R. <laughs> Yeah, with a circle around it. And that means copyright restricted. And the lawyers at Pokemon Inc. were not very amused about this. Because it turns out that the Pokemon gene contributes to the spread of cancer in mice. And kind of understandably, they didn't want their cute little pocket monsters confused with tumors. And so they actually threatened to sue the heck out of these scientists. They were really going to take them to the cleaners over this until, you know, the scientists backed down and they eventually gave it some other terrible gene name. But for one shining moment, there was actually a Pokemon gene. So one question people often have uh, with my books is they want to know, like, where did the titles come from? It's not obvious that you would call a book about genetics the violinist thumb. So where, where did that title come from? Uh, so I thought I would explain where the title came from and why I used that as a title for this book. So obviously there was a violinist involved, uh, this man right here, named Niccolo Paganini, usually considered the greatest violinist who ever lived. He was active in Europe in the very early 1800s, uh, and pretty much every king, every queen, every pope, every emperor wanted Paganini to come play for them because he was the absolute greatest musician who they had ever seen. 
in fact, if you've ever heard those stories about musicians selling their soul to Satan in order to get their talent, usually nowadays it's blues musicians who've done it. But actually, a lot of those stories started with Paganini. He was the origin of a lot of those rumors because they said there was no way someone could be this good at the violin unless he'd made some sort of pact with the devil. There's no other possible way. Well, it turns out there were some actual nonfiction reasons why Paganini was so good. And one of these reasons was he had these amazingly, even freakishly flexible hands. So one thing he could do, he could take his pinky like this, and he could bend his pinky into a right angle with the rest of his hand just by stretching it out like that. So it actually gets worse because he could also put his hand down flat on a table like this. And then he could raise his pinky and his thumb kind of like that. And then he could actually touch them behind his hand just by going like that. So he could do things with his hands you should not be able to do with your hands. But that actually gave him a big advantage when he was playing the violin. He could stretch his hands incredibly wide. He could bend them in unusual ways, do fingerings no one else could do. And as a result, he could play music that no one had ever been able to play before. And that's one of the reasons he was such an amazing violinist. And from a modern perspective, it's almost certain that Paganini had a genetic disorder of some sort, because it wasn't just his fingers that were amazingly flexible. He could bend his elbows the wrong way, his knees bent backwards. He was basically like a circus rubber band. He could tie himself in all sorts of knots, and we're pretty certain he had one of a few possible genetic disorders that gave him these amazingly flexible joints. And I like this as the title story of the book for a few reasons. Uh, one is that we usually think about something like genetics, a science, being on one end of a spectrum, and then something like uh, music, a fine arts, being on another end of the spectrum. They seem kind of completely separate. But in this case, if you know a little bit about the genetics and you know a little bit about the music, you can actually see there's a nice connection between them. Learning about each one helps you understand the other. They kind of reinforce each other in a very nice way. And that's something I really strive to do with the stories in my books, is to show these connections between the science and the fine arts or the politics or whatever, things you wouldn't necessarily think to connect, do really have this deep down connection if you dig a little bit deeper. And there was another reason I wanted to pick this as the title story as well, and that there's an actual good science lesson buried deep down here. In that, yes, Paganini had these amazing hands, but he was also a very hard worker, and he loved playing and practicing music. He also grew up in an environment, very early 1800s Europe, where violinists were the rock stars of their day. They were the best, most important musicians around. So not only did he have the genes to help him be a great violinist, he had the right temperament, he was a hard worker, and he grew up in the right environment to take advantage of those traits. And if you talk to geneticists nowadays about genetics, the science, the field, where is it going, that's one important thing. As they emphasize, it's not just isolated genes, single individual genes. It's gene-environment interactions, genes working with different parts of you, genes how they affect your temperament and how your temperament can help you take advantage of your genes. There's a lot going on there. And if you look at Paganini's life story, I think all of those lessons are buried in there. So not only because of that cool connection between the fine arts and the genetics, but there's a good science lesson in there if you just learn a little bit more about Paganini's life. And that's why I chose it as the title story for the book, The Violinist Thumb. Uh, so again, that was my second book. And then a few years after that, I came out with a third book uh, called The Tale of the Dueling Neurosurgeons. And this one, obviously, uh, is about neuroscience. Again, a kind of a story book. And one thing people often want to know, again, besides like the title of the book, is they want to know, like, why were you inspired to write this book? You know, you're, there are thousands of topics you could have chosen. Why did you choose this topic right here, neuroscience? And I can say, actually, that the reason I chose this book uh, was doubt or skepticism or mistrust, kind of whatever you want to call it. Uh, because a few years ago, I was actually flipping through a book, I was reading someone else's book, and I came across a story that made me say, 
I, I think that sounds like bull roar. I said, I don't think that this actually took place. The story just seemed too outlandish, too strange. It was about someone who'd gotten injured in one part of his brain, and his behavior shifted in this very unusual way. And I just thought, I, I don't think I believe. I think the author made a mistake there. But I sort of forgot about it till a few weeks later. I was reading a different book, and something similar happened. A woman got injured in one part of her brain. Her behavior shifted in this odd way. And I thought, that sounds like more baloney. I said, I just don't think that story's true. So I set out to kind of prove these authors wrong, do a little bit of research on my own. And of course, I ended up looking foolish because they were right, I was wrong. But these stories kind of stuck with me because of how specific and unusual the deficits uh, the people were showing were. So what kind of stories were these? Well, I'm sure we can all recognize generally what types of animals these are in the picture. You know, even if we don't know genus and species or whatever, we can kind of narrow it down. We basically can recognize these animals. But it turns out uh, that if you get nicked in one spot in the temporal lobe, which is on the side of your brain, which is on your, near your temple, you get nicked in one spot in the temporal lobe, all knowledge of animals can disappear out of your brain. Now, these people can still tell plants apart. They can still tell individual human faces apart. They can still tell human-made objects apart. But dogs, fish, raccoons, elephants, whatever, all look the same to them. They cannot tell these creatures apart. Turns out something very similar can happen. You get nicked in another slightly different spot of the temporal lobe. All knowledge of plants can disappear out of your mind. And these people can recognize animals, no problem. Plants, they, can't rec they cannot tell them apart at all. And looking into the, uh, where this came from, why this might have happened, I think there was actually a good lesson there. In that if you think about our ancestors way back when, you know, wandering around the savanna or the jungle or wherever they were, certain people were very good about classifying and recognizing different types of plants and animals. They could say, okay, these animals are good to eat. These animals are poisonous. Stay away. These animals are good companions. We should be friends with them. Same with plants. These are good to eat. These are poisonous. These are good medicines. And the people who were good at recognizing and classifying different types of plants and animals eventually had an advantage. And over the long term, that uh, ability to recognize them got sort of hardwired into our brain. And it's something that basically all of us have nowadays. We're very good about recognizing different types of animals and plants. Very, very good at it. Uh, and so I thought, well, you know, it's kind of cool. We get a little bit of an insight into our evolutionary history just based on this little tiny brain injury. I thought that's very cool. And the second story uh, about the woman who got injured I thought was even more interesting and more revealing. Uh, so this woman actually had a problem with producing language. And it's sadly common, I'm sure all of us in here have either heard a story or maybe had someone in our family this happen to. Someone has a stroke or an injury of some sort, and then they lose the ability to speak. They just cannot get words out anymore. It's a very, very frustrating condition to be in. Uh, and in some people, what gets damaged is the area highlighted in peach there, an area called Broca's area in the brain. Very important for producing language. In other people, though, something slightly different happens. In them, the Broca's area, the part that produces language, is actually OK. It's undamaged. What's damaged is the part right next to the Broca's part. And that part next to the Broca's part is very important. Because if you think about it, the Broca's area is up in your brain. And you're actually speaking with your teeth, your tongue, and the lips. So somehow that information has to get from your brain down to your mouth. And that information is basically carried along what are biological wires, what are called neurons and nerve cells. And in some people, the part that gets damaged is not the Broca's area. It's the nerves and the neurons that get damaged. So it's basically like if you had your computer hooked up and the wire got damaged. So the computer might be OK, but if the wire is not working, then it's still not going to do much. So the wires inside these people were damaged. And again, they just couldn't speak because of the broken wires. But when you start reading about the brain, start learning about the brain, you learn something pretty quickly. 
And that is that there are a lot of alternative pathways, a lot of detours, a lot of back alleys for information to get sent around inside the brain. And it just so happens that there is one of these back alleys, these detours, that goes from the language centers of the brain into the emotional centers of the brain. And then taking this back alley, the emotional centers can still get in touch with the teeth, the tongue, and the lips. So in these people with the broken direct connection, but the intact indirect connection, if you try to have a conversation with them, just normal everyday conversation, because the direct connection is broken, they just can't get the words out. They struggle to speak. But it, because they have this indirect connection through the emotional centers, if you rile them up, you get them angry, you get their emotions involved, it turns out that they can swear at you no problem at all. They'll say, you beepity beep beep, and then they'll just sort of jump back because in a lot of cases, they had no idea they could produce these words themselves. They just bubbled up out of the emotional unconscious centers of the brain. Uh, and actually something can, similar can happen in that there are connections between the language areas, the parts of the brain that process music, and then the musical parts of the brain can still get in touch with the mouth. And in these people, even though they can't have a normal everyday conversation, they can sing song lyrics no problem at all. In fact, if you remember, there was a congresswoman in Arizona a few years ago, Gabrielle Giffords, who got shot in the head. She lost the ability to speak. But she was one of those people who could still sing song lyrics. And so when she went to rehab, she was doing things like singing Girls Just Want to Have Fun. And I don't know why, you know, Cindy Lauper, out of all the songs, stuck in her head. But by practicing singing again, she was eventually able to rehabilitate herself to some degree and learn how to speak to some degree. So this idea of us having these back alleys, these back connections, actually has a, a um, supportive role in rehabbing people, helping them get better. So again, this injury really revealed something deep and important about how our brains function. And while I was researching these stories, I just thought, wow, you know, that's really fascinating. Like, who would have thought that getting injured in one part of the brain would be sort of a window into understand how our brains work, our evolutionary history? And I just thought, that's really fascinating. I bet you could write a whole book just based on different injuries and what those injuries reveal about how our brains work. And then sort of the cartoon light bulb went off over my own head, and I said, well, you know, maybe I should write a book like that. That sounds really interesting. So that's where this book came from, was I wanted to write about all these different injuries, injuries mostly to normal, everyday people like you and like me. They would get injured in one part of their brain, and their world would shift in this very specific, very unusual way that revealed a lot about how all of our brains work. There are fascinating, fascinating cases about what can happen to these people when their brains get injured but also how people recover from these injuries, the really ingenious ways the brain compensates. And by the end of the book, I thought there was a lot of hope in learning about how resilient our brains are in some ways and the amazing ways that people do cope with a lot of these injuries. And I wanted to wrap up with one of the, I thought, more interesting stories in the book. So it's not about some sort of basic function, something like recognizing plants and animals or you know, sending signals around. It's kind of one of these higher level, more highfalutin things that neuroscientists have started to get a little bit of traction. I mean, philosophers have been debating, have been debating things like you know, the nature of the self, free will, consciousness for thousands of years. But neuroscientists lately have been able to get a little bit of traction on that by studying different and unusual types of brains. And this next brain was one of the more unusual types of brains out there. So this story gets started in, or I should say near Vancouver, about the year 2005 or so. Uh, so a woman there found out that she was having twins, so she was pretty excited about that. But one of the later sonograms, uh, the doctor said, I'm sorry, I have some bad news. Uh, your twins are conjoined, what used to be called Siamese twins. So basically, they had grown together. Uh, and when the birth came about, as you can see here, uh, they were actually conjoined at the head. So they had a Siamese brain linking them together. And I should emphasize that the girls, uh, Krista and Tatiana, they're both alive today, they're both healthy, they're happy, they're going to school, they have friends. You know, things turned out about as well as it could have for the two girls. 
But because they do have this Siamese brain, they do show some unusual behaviors. So in particular, the part of their brain that's connected is a structure called the thalamus. Now we all have a thalamus deep inside the brain, and it's basically a relay center for sensory information. So when information comes in through your eyes, through your ears, through your mouth, the thalamus is one of the very first places that processes this information. So because these two girls share a thalamus, they share a lot of sensory information. So, well, I mean, what does that mean? Well, it turns out that if one of the girls, say, takes a sip on a cup of juice, her sister can actually taste the juice in her mouth. You give one of them a shot at the doctor's office, the other one grabs her arm in pain. You tickle one of them, the other one starts to laugh. They fall asleep together. They maybe even dream together. And scientists have never seen anything like this, where this specific structure was connected. And it kind of brings up a lot of, again, sort of highfalutin questions about what their experiences are like. And one of these, exper or one of these questions that comes up is, you know, they're sharing sensory information. A large part of our consciousness is sharing sen or is uh, being aware of things, taking in sensory information. So are these two girls one larger individual? Or are they you know, still like two people split among these two bodies, even though they're sharing some thoughts? And the answer is we don't quite know. Maybe it's a little ambiguous. Maybe there's not a good hard and fast answer. But I think a lot of the evidence actually points to them being two individual people. Uh, for instance, the girls, they'll often walk up to somebody and one or both of them will say something like, I am just me. Now that's kind of an unusual thing to say. Probably no one in this room would walk up to somebody and just say that. But apparently they sort of feel that need to define themselves as independent people. So they do, it seems, feel like they are individual people, which should count for something. Uh, another sort of anecdotal uh, example of why they're probably two individual people is that it turns out that one of the girls, uh, you know, likes ketchup. You know, she loves ketchup on her hot dogs, on her fries, everything. Unfortunately, her sister really hates ketchup and is always kind of like scraping her tongue when her sister eats it because she can taste it in her mouth at the same time. And you know, it's, it's kind of an unusual story, but it does, there's an important lesson there in that the girls are getting basically the same input, but they're reacting to it in different ways. They're reacting to it like individuals would. And I think that is a good sign that they probably are more like two individual people, even if they're sharing a brain. And again, scientists really have been able to get some traction on kind of these highfalutin ideas by studying different things like these unusual brains, unusual brain structure, memory problems, language problems, consciousness problems, personality shifting, by studying these very uh, unusual, uh, but very revealing and very powerful individual cases. Um, so I've actually written a fourth book. Uh, I'm not gonna go into it right now. It's called the uh, Caesar's Last Breath. Um, but I just wanted to wrap up by making a short little confession here in that I have been sort of tricking you a little bit this whole time. I've been up here kind of telling you stories about different things like that. But what I've really been trying to do, I hope, is imparting some science, getting some science across to you by telling you stories, sort of slipping it in there on the sly. Hopefully you were learning and you didn't even realize you were learning something. And I think that's a very powerful way, actually, to teach any subject, but science especially, because it can be a little bit intimidating for people. But, you know, it turns out that the human brain, probably the way we remember information best, is when it's presented in a story form. You give us tables, you give us facts, you give us dates. We are terrible with that information. We just cannot keep track of too much of it. But you tell us a story, you have a beginning, a middle, and end. You have heroes and villains and characters. We are very, very good about remembering information when it's presented in that form. So I hope you enjoyed the stories tonight. But I really hope, deep down, you can walk away with a deeper appreciation for all of the wonders of science and the stories about science. So again, thank you all for joining me this evening. And I think we could probably do about, you know, five or ten minutes of questions, if anyone has any. I was just wondering in your research, if you run across any politicians, I think 
<laughs> he asked me if I've come across politicians saying things that are weird. Um, uh, none come to mind. I mean, to me, you mean specifically? I mean, there's politicians saying weird things like all the time, but not to, nothing to me specifically. So. Um, I do, though, I write about, you know, evolution and things like that. The last book was about um, uh, climate science, uh, environmental science. So environmental science is unfortunately kind of a political topic nowadays. Um, you write about evolution, genetics, you're going to get a lot of people writing you angry letters, things like that. And you just, it's kind of the, one of the hazards of being a science writer, I guess. Um, with you and then we'll. She asked if the twins can be separated. Um, the answer is probably not. The brain and the head in general has a lot of blood vessels going to it, so it would be very hard to control that, and they just don't think they could do it. They did try to separate a few years ago a few twins from Iran who were connected at the head, um, two sisters, and they both ended up dying from the procedure, so it seems unlikely. Uh, with you. When's it? You sound like my editor. Um, I will have a new book out in 2019, July 2019. Um, and the premise of that book is, so during World War II, um, the, there were a lot of refugee scientists from Europe coming over, working on the Manhattan Project. And they were convinced that the Germans were way ahead of us on uh, atomic fission research because atomic fission had been discovered there. Werner Heisenberg and all the best scientists were there. They had the best industry in the world, and they were in a, a diabolical regime. They were convinced they were several years ahead of us. So they eventually convinced the Manhattan Project honchos to send over this undercover commando team to try to sabotage and spy on and even assassinate members of the Nazi nuclear bomb program. So this story, the book, is about the, that team that they sent over and all the different things that they were involved in. Um, and like there was an ex-Major League Baseball catcher who turned into a spy. Um, JFK, his older brother, Joe, was peripherally involved in it. So there's a lot of really great characters, really fun stories. So I'm excited about that book. Um, I'd just like to thank you because I have two um, questions. Um, one is biochem major kids, and I'm a communication person, so science is not my thing, but because of your books, I can relate to them. Oh. So thank, you. thank you, I appreciate that. She asked me if I'm going to be on Radio Lab soon. Um, I don't know. They they have kind of shifted a little bit. I've noticed they they used to be kind of a science heavy story, and now they've branched out into some really amazing stories about you know going all over the world to different stories. Um, but they have kind of gotten away from the science a little. Um, I did write some podcast scripts recently for something called American Innovation, American Innovators, I think it was called, um, very closely related to my DNA book. And I've done some other podcasts and things like that. Um, I'm always hopeful to get back on there. Though. It was very fun being on the show. Yeah, other science writers that I really admire and recommend. Um, a few come to mind. Um, David Quammen's a great science writer. Um, Carl Zimmer, he's the New York Times science columnist. Uh, Deborah Bloom has written some fantastic books. I think she has another one coming out soon. Um, Amy Stewart writes some very funny, very good books. Um, and then there are other people uh, that write uh, science fiction books that have a very um, they're very well grounded in science. Neil Stevenson, I think, is, writes some fantastic books. Um, Connie Willis, she writes some, um, they're, they're not hard science fiction, but they're very fun science fiction. There's some good, like, sort of human science in those books as well. So I recommend those books. Yep? Could you give us a 30 second uh, overview of the book about Caesar's Last Breath? Sure, he asked for a 30 second overview of Caesar's Last Breath. Um, <laughs> So basically the idea is, you know, imagine inhaling, you inhale a bunch of different gases. There's oxygen and nitrogen, obviously, but there's a lot of other different gases. There's things like pollutants, um, refrigerants, there's fallout from 1950s, radioactive weapons tests still floating around. All these different gases we inhale every time we take a breath. And so the book takes all of these different gases we inhale 
and spins a story about them, about where they come from, how they affect our lives and our evolution, our history, how they affected the planet Earth in different ways, and just tries to give you a better appreciation for what the air is, where it came from, how it's changed drastically over the past few hundred million or few billion years, and just tries to make the air something kind of intelligible and fun and interesting to read about. Did I make it? 30? Okay. <laughs> Do I teach science? No, I don't teach science. Um, I did teach for one year in a high school in St. Paul in Minnesota. Um, and I had very bad classroom management skills. Like, they ran, <laughs> they ran roughshod over me. Um, so I, I stopped that. Um, I was a tutor after that, and I liked tutoring a lot. I enjoyed teaching and like getting the science across, but I was, I guess, not just a commanding presence uh, in front of these teenagers. So. I'm just curious, as a past physics lover, are we going to see an astrophysics book from you? An astrophysics book? Um, I, well, the reason, I mean, I get asked often why I haven't written a physics book, and the next one coming out is physics because I hadn't found a story I really wanted to tell with physics. So I guess the same sort of answer with astrophysics is I just haven't found like the stories yet that I want to tell. I think I really start not so much from the science side as the story side, and then just whatever the stories are, that's the science I happen to go with. So if I find it or if you know great astrophysics <laughs> stories, and maybe the next one after that. So I can probably do one more if someone had. You're glad I broke the first amount. All right, thank you. What is your favorite element? <laughs> My favorite element. Well, I mean, it's mercury up here, and then like, all the other elements um, kind of straggling below them. Right, what's your second favorite element? <laughs> second favorite. Um, I mean, one that comes to mind is an element that I would never have thought of. I mean, I probably knew it was an element, maybe not before. I definitely didn't know how to pronounce it. It's element 42. It's molybdenum. It's an obscure element. Probably not a lot of people have heard of it. But then I found out this amazing story about it, how the Germans during World War I realized that for their big Bertha guns that they were getting warped and deformed because the steel wasn't hard enough. And the only way they could get the steel hard enough was to put this molybdenum, this obscure element, into them. Problem was Germany had no molybdenum. So they said, where are the molybdenum mines around the world? There was only one molybdenum mine in the world, which was in Colorado. And it was this obscure, unusual mine where they eventually ended up sending a bunch of German agent provocateurs into there to run them off the mine, throw them off cliffs, tear up their tents, basically to run them off this mine for this obscure element. So it's basically the most remote battle of World War I that took place on this little tiny mine in the middle of Colorado. So just a story like that, like an element you would never have heard of that had a really kind of fun story behind it. So I'll go with molybdenum's number two. All right. Well, again, thank you, everyone. I'm here signing books. If you have